San Diego State has stated their intention to leave the Mountain West, and in return, the Mountain West Conference is turning into Hector Barbosa from Pirates of the Caribbean. You are Locked On Pac-12, your daily podcast on the Pac-12 Conference. It's the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Locked On Pack 12. I'm your host, Spencer McLaughlin. Thank you so much for making this your first listen or your first view of the day. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day, and your number one source to stay up to date with our media rights free and beloved Conference of Champions. I was asked to do that by Eric. Like, comment, subscribe, please, and thank you wherever you listen to or watch the show. Rate, review us as well on uh, Apple Podcasts. Appreciate all of that. What on earth am I talking about? I'm a big pop culture movie references sort of guy. And by the way, that was a pretty poor impression, at least by my own standards, of the let's get ready to rumble guy because that's what I was asked to do but I didn't forget man of my word I could do better but that's what we got right now so why do I incorporate that particular reference well San Diego State is Elizabeth Swan she has been taken aboard the Black Pearl by Hector Barbosa and his band of pirates who are of course cursed and trying to uh, return to the Illa del Muerto and yada 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 we all understand that sort of stuff and Elizabeth Swan, the governor's daughter, though they don't know that she's the governor's daughter because she's lying to him, of course, says with regards to, uh, you know, she insults their intelligence a little bit. And she says, I want you to leave Port Royal and never come back. And then Barbosa, a great character, by the way, responds, I'm disinclined to acquiesce to your request. So San Diego State stated their intention to leave the Mountain West. And then the conference basically said what I thought they might do on yesterday's show or what I would do if I were in their position. They basically went into Barbosa mode and said, we are disinclined to acquiesce to your request. Because the indication that we have gotten here at this point in time is that the Pac-12 media deal is not a couple days away from being finished. And that the timeline might extend into July for when they will wrap this up. So San Diego State goes to the Mountain West and, and we're slowly becoming locked on San Diego State here, which frankly, I'm fine with. I've had great interactions with San Diego State fans out there. I'm here for it. So anyway, they go to the Mountain West and say, hey, we're going to leave the conference, which is not what you would like us to do. And then as we do that, we'd like you to do us a favor. And San Diego State got the very clear response from the Mountain West of, yeah, okay, no. If the Pac-12 can't get it together in time, that's a you problem because we as the Mountain West, like I completely understand what they're doing here, playing hardball. They are not in a position where they have to acquiesce to anything San Diego State wants because the Mountain West exists to serve its own best interests. And its own best interests are neither San Diego State leaving, nor are they giving them an, nor would it be serving their own interests to give them an extension, thereby depriving them of a larger exit fee that kicks in, according to the conference bylaws, on June 30th. So I think the Mountain West is playing this the right way from their own standpoint. It complicates things a little bit for the Pac 12. So Pete Thamel, again, who uh, broke the initial San Diego State report uh, yesterday, later tweeted out, uh, and not long had, after I had actually recorded the show, that according to his sources, and I, I trust Pete Thamel, I don't necessarily blindly trust everybody who's reporting news nowadays, but Pete Thamel, yeah, I'm inclined to say the guy knows what he's talking about. The Mountain West Conference sent an additional letter to San Diego State on Friday informing the school that at this time they will not approve any exceptions they requested last week, which was from San Diego State's side an extension 
of the deadline to leave before the exit fee goes from 17 to $34 million and being allowed to pay that over the course of time, the Mountain West said, no, we're not going to do any of that. An additional month before departure, reduced exit fee or the ability to pay out the exit fee in installments. The letter came in response to San Diego State claiming it had not given formal notice of withdrawal. The Mountain West said in the latest letter that they do not accept San Diego State's claim that they have not given formal notice of resignation from the league. So now we have kind of a spitting match between San Diego State and the Mountain West. Now, there, there are a few things in, in play here. First of all, as I said, the Mountain West is serving their own best interests. So anyone who's mad at them for that you, you, you can't be like, what are they supposed to do? They're not there to do whatever's best for San Diego State. They're doing what is best for the conference. I completely understand that. That's what I would do if I were in uh, their position. Number one. Number two, this thought occurred to me. Perhaps no, notice, notice the wording here. Notice the wording here from the Mountain West. Informing the school that at this time they will not approve any exceptions they requested last week. I 100% had the thought, and we could see this end up uh, bearing itself out, that this could be a negotiation tactic where it's San Diego State is coming to the table and already knowing you know, what they want, what they're requesting, and what exactly they would like to get from the conference the conference then could come in as they have with a hardline stance, maybe not, maybe not with the full intention of sticking to it forever and always, but they put in the words at this time, I think to kind of open the door to further negotiation. So I think that this could be a tactic from the Mountain West to say, you came to us and you wanted an extension and you wanted to pay it over time and you want to do this, that, and the other thing. And if the Mountain West comes in with a hard stance fully on the other side of where San Diego State would like them to be, then that may force San Diego State to come back to the negotiating table and say, okay, what if we gave you this and this? And then the Mountain West might get more out of that, right? They might get a, a larger reduced exit fee if it doesn't end up going to, to $34 million. Or they may get, you know, the, the, the payments all at once rather than being over over the course of time. Not sure exactly how all those details can can play out. But I don't think the communication between San Diego State and the Mountain West is going to just break off here entirely. I think what you're going to have is kind of this little back and forth, this little push and pull of, hey, we want this. No, we want that. No, we won't give you this. We won't give you that. But a threat is only as good as your willingness to actually act on it. So I, I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility either that this is just the Mountain West's position straight up and that it's not a negotiating tactic, that it's not a tool or a gimmick to get more concessions out of San Diego State as they depart the conference here, it may very well be, as I discussed on yesterday's show, that they're just saying, mm, nope, you're not going to be able to leave the conference unless you pay us $34 million if it comes after June 30th, or it'll be $17 million before June 30th, and you will pay it all up front. Now, whether or not San Diego State could get any assistance from the Pac-12 on that front, I am unclear as to how all those uh, those dynamics work. But this is a fascinating and, and continually evolving situation, to say the least. But what does that mean for the Pac-12? It means a couple of things. One of them is that you all need to go check out FanDuel because baseball season is in full swing and there's no better place to get in on the action than FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get a no sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's $1,000 back in bonus bets. If your first bet doesn't win, just go to FanDuel.com slash locked on to join today. Don't miss your chance to snag that no sweat first bet up to $1,000. Wherever you want to gamble on, Pac-12 over-unders, championship odds, making the playoff, individual matchups, there are already betting lines that you can place a wager on one side or the other, whether it's Colorado and TCU, Utah and Florida, whatever tickles, tickles your fancy, you can go out there and get it at FanDuel. Go to FanDuel.com slash locked on to sign up. Get that no sweat first bet up to $1,000. FanDuel.com slash locked on. FanDuel official partner of Major League Baseball.
I need to double down on the second segment sip here. Okay, now we're ready because we got a lot to get to. So what does this mean for the Pac-12? This means a, a couple of things and why they need to be monitoring the situation so closely. If the Mountain West is serious in its threat of you will not leave the conference without following to a T the bylaws that you agreed to under this contract previously, then the Pac-12 suddenly has to put their foot on the gas pedal to figure out the media deal. And they would have, as this episode is dropping and airing, wherever you're listening or watching right now, thank you for doing that, by the way, they would have 10 days to get it done. Now, that's one option, is get the media rights deal done. Like, if th this all becomes completely moot and we go back to status quo, if the Pac-12 ends up completing finalizing, announcing, signing its media deal within the next 10 days. I don't find that to be likely. I don't find it to be impossible. But there was an indication that it was going to go out into July. I think that was from Michael Crow or Ray Anderson, one of the two guys at Arizona State, president or athletic director there, that it indicated go out, it could go out that long. Regardless, there isn't an indication that, ah, oh, you know, they're, 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 they're right there, right? Like there was the Washington State News last week and they had the, you know, grant of rights thing on their, uh, on their agenda to give Kirk Schultz the authority to do yada, yada, yada. And all that was great and fine. But I said then and I'm saying now, we, we just shouldn't get our hopes up or else we are Charlie Brown with the football. And the Pac-12 is Lucy. Here we go. I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to hold it for you, Charlie Brown. I'm not going to pull it away this time. I'm not going to do it. Whips it away. Charlie Brown falls on his butt. Looks like a fool. All the friends laughing at him. I'm not going to be Charlie Brown anymore. So let's operate under the assumption that this is going to go into July because why not? I guess the part, the current pact, which wouldn't, I mean, <laughs> many thoughts on that front, just as a quick aside, the current Pac 12 media rights deal technically expires July 1st, 2024. The big 10, signed their media deal 11 months before their current one was set to expire. So if they were to operate on that timeline, August 1st, oh my gosh, God help us all. Pray for my sanity. <laughs> Pray for my sanity. If we're still talking about the prospect of getting a media deal signed, sealed, and delivered on August 1st. I, I don't I don't know what I'd be doing. Just okay. Anyway, get off of that front. So so that's the first option for for the Pac-12 is get this thing done in the next ten days. Announce San Diego State and SMU and move on from this entire saga, which has been eventful to say the least. The second option for the Pac-12 is to say okay, we are not going to be able to complete the media deal in its best possible iteration by June 30th. We need to go into July, but we promise we'll get it done then, guys. Wink. The wink is for the audio people. I know you watching on YouTube can see me doing the sarcastic wink, but got to appeal to both uh, both audiences here who consume the show because I'm grateful and appreciative to all of you and want you to feel included. And also, good time to plug the mailbag because you can always hop into it. YouTube comments or hit me up on Twitter at smalls underscore 55 or at LO underscore pack 12. DMs and mentions are wide open. But option number one, get the deal done. Option number two, if the Mountain West doesn't budge on their stance that, yeah, if you announce or if you, if you submit the final paper, paperwork here to leave the conference and begin the formal process of leaving to go elsewhere, if you do that after June 30th, yeah, that exit fee, as is written in the bylaws that you agreed to and that you are still a part of San Diego State, if that doubles to $34 million, the second option for the Pac-12 is, hey, if we you know, have a little bit longer, we can get the most out of the media rights deal, and we can somehow, some way, help you pay that over time and maybe make a phone call to the Mountain West and say, you will get this money, we'll help you pay. Maybe. That would be, that would be option number two. I, I personally, as host of this show, would prefer option number one. That's what I would like to have happen. Like if you told me five days from now, I wake up and the media deal is announced 
and it's all done and San Diego State and SMU and they sign the grant of rights and then we can move on uh, to the next round of realignment and who the Pac-12 should be watching for there. A lot of interesting candidates, by the way. Yeah, I'd be super, super down for that. But those are kind of the options as I see them for for the Pac-12 here. And then there is door number three, and I would hate this one most of all, and that's forget adding San Diego State and SMU. Well, actually, SMU is a little bit different, but forget adding San Diego State for 2024, and they pick up SMU and, like, I don't know, Tulane or somebody or... Yeah, that'd probably be who they'd pair with down there. Rice is already going to the American, so they're not going to do that. Boise, Fresno, academically not going to pass the smell test there. So, yeah, go add SMU and Tulane, I guess, and leave out San Diego State and bum me out from now until the end of time. So get the deal done. Wait and help San Diego State pay or try to facilitate some sort of back-channel deal there with the Mountain West. Or don't add them for 2024. Wait until the next round and add them for 2025 and beyond. Maybe just add SMU. Be the Pac-11 for a season. I don't know. That could be an option. But why don't we cross that bridge when we come to it? Because that sounds like too much Alice in Wonderland going down the rabbit hole and descending into madness there. So uh, let's go to a mailbag question that came in here from Bud. Mailbag. Is the Pac-12 in a position of strength by negotiating their media rights agreement after the other Power 5 conferences? So, no, is the, is, is the short answer. They're not in a position of strength because they don't have a deal. However, there is a card in there that I think they play pretty consistently in all these media rights talks that does give them some element of leverage and why I don't buy into the whole narrative that they're just never going to get a deal and the conference is going to fold and whatnot. The Pac-12, you know, for all the crap that Pac-12 after dark takes, and I understand it, it is a legitimate bargaining chip in these talks because college football and live sports are big time commodities for these networks and media companies. And that exists no matter who you're talking to, ESPN, Fox, uh, you know, the Pac-12 network, Ion Television, <laughs> you know, just like go, go down the list, Apple, Amazon, whoever. So particularly for ESPN, ESPN has been one of the biggest sources, along with Fox, of college football for, I don't know, ever, as long as the sport has been on television. And it is valuable to them to be able to show college football and college football content, going with, starting with college game day, from the morning, and now Fox has got the big noon kickoff and whatnot. They want to be all in on football all day long. And no, the East Coast people don't see Pac-12 after dark as much as other games during the day. It doesn't mean, however, that they are still not viewed and they don't give the Pac-12 something that they can present to these media companies that nobody else can. The Eastern time zone cannot play games that start at 10 o'clock Eastern, 7 p.m. Pacific, or 11 Eastern, 8 Pacific, whatever, which is a little bit too, you know, after dark-ish. But that's a discussion for another day. Nobody else can do that. No other Power 5 conference can do that. And it's why a conference like the Big 12 and Brett Yormark, their commissioner, want to expand to the Western time zone so they can be on television all day long. If you exist in four time zones as a conference, right, say San Diego State, uh, doesn't end up in the Pac-12, and in the next round of realignment, the Big 12 takes them, Fresno State, Boise State, and you know UNLV, for instance. You now have four schools in your conference in the Western Time Zone. I'm not saying they're massive brands and whatnot, but think about that as a conference commissioner. You can show Big 12 football on Saturday from morning all through the night, all day, literally all day long. You always have a team. You always have a game on television somewhere at some point in time. That is inherently valuable to a conference. You want to be on TV as much as possible. You want your name out there. You want schools out there. You want to create a great product. You want to do all this sort of stuff. So that is, I think, the only element of quote-unquote leverage the Pac-12 has. But because they're the only conference that doesn't have a deal yet, I think it's pretty clear they are in these talks from a position 
of low leverage and they are working, scrapping, fighting, clawing to find the best possible deal that they can and it hasn't materialized yet. And yeah, my curiosity is peaked beyond belief as to what the deal is actually going to be and how much it's actually going to be worth and whatnot and not the speculation and estimation and prognostication and whatnot. What can they actually get there? But if you were operating from a position of leverage, if you were operating from a position of strength and authority in these talks, aside from offering the late night window, which is something, but it's not a lot compared to what, you know, a conference like the Big Ten can offer or the SEC, for instance, it is not a position of strength because the Pac-12 needs a deal. Now, ESPN, I think, or and or Fox need late night college football content as well. So that's why I think it ends up being, you know, a part of, uh, of the deal at the end of the day. But again, that's just a guess at this point in time. I think the only other element of potential leverage you could say the Pac-12 might be operating with right now is whatever streamer they're working with, right? The streamer, let's say it's Apple, which based on the last couple months is kind of where things have been trending. Amazon, based on reports, of, is kind of, you know, faded and Apple's, you know, risen to the forefront and whatnot. Like, you know, whatever. It's a streamer. So... With those companies, I think you have more leverage there because they are trying to get into the sports space. So they need you as much as you need them. But for a company like Fox, for instance, they might feel, and eh, we don't need you as much as you need us. But if you're trying to get into live sports, if you're trying to break into college football, being the only conference still out there does, I think, give you some leverage with the streaming companies, right? Because you can, you can play the card, but again, how far can you go? given the you know a scarcity of, of available media partners at this point in time how far can you go with the bargaining chip if you're george klyovkov and you know whoever else is involved negotiating the deal i assume it's not just him there's a team of people involved and such but how far can you go you know to to raise the threat of like well if if you aren't going to give us this then you just won't be in the college football space that's a tough calculation to make i'm glad that i don't have to make it but I think it's one that, you know, can in theory be presented in those sorts of talks is like, you know, Apple wants to be in live sports. They've got the MLS. They're involved with Major League Baseball. Now they want to be in the football space. This is the only way they can do that right now. And I think that's a position of leverage. But everywhere else with the traditional media companies, I think it's pretty clear they don't have uh, they're, they're, they're not in a great position right now because losing the LA market is just a massive, massive crushing, crushing blow. Uh, speaking of broadcasting schedules, by the way, so the schedule release came out uh, last week in terms of the the game times for the first three weeks of non-conference play. Uh, conference play still yet to be determined and such, but week one for, for the Pac-12, just talk about week one here. I mean, I mean there, there are a lot of great non-conference games. I've discussed them here on the show uh, several times before amidst all the media rights stuff. It is nice to talk about actual football from time to time. But there are some really, really great opportunities for the Pac-12. But week one, the television lineup, and this is what I was talking about with, you know, playing games from morning until the night. Like, that is valuable for a conference to be able to do because you can get in front of more people, you can build brands, you can, you know, build excitement, get on the eyes, get on the radars of, uh, of media people and voter, AP voters, college football playoff committee, all that sort of stuff. So, like, buzz is good. You want buzz, you want interest, you want intrigue, you want excitement. So, week one for the Pac 12 is set up really, really well. And they will, in week one, have exactly what I was referring to, which is at all points of time during the day, there's going to be a Pac-12 game on national television. And that is fantastic for the conference and will give them a chance to display how strong the league is, how strong it can be, and how entertaining of a product these teams can be and how entertaining of a product the league can be. I'm not saying it's factoring into the negotiations that they're having with media rights companies right now. I'm just saying separately from that, it is going to be a good look for the Pac-12. So the first game in week one, Colorado at TCU, 9 a.m. Pacific time. It's the big noon kickoff game, the first big noon kickoff game of the year, which is almost always, almost always a Big Ten matchup. Also has a lot of Big 12 games in there as well. Stuff like the Red River Showdown. Colorado at TCU, right? And that is the Coach Prime effect. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. I'm not going to try and spin that another way. Deion Sanders against the reigning runner-ups 
in college football and Peach Bowl champions. I think it was. Uh, no, they no, they were in the Fiesta Bowl against Michigan. Reigning Fiesta Bowl champions and national runners up, TCU hosting Colorado. They're a huge favorite, and no one's going to care because everyone wants to see what Colorado is going to look like. So that's at 9 a.m. Pacific time. Then 12:30 Pacific time. Washington off of their 11 and 2 season hosting Boise State. Biggest G5 brand out West for sure. And I expect Washington to be perfectly fine at home in that game. But you never know. Boise's pulled an upset or two uh, a, a time or two in the past. They've been known to do that from, from time to time. Certainly an interesting matchup. 12.30 p.m. Pacific time on ABC. Then on ESPNU at 1 o'clock, Cal goes at North Texas. Got to get off to a good start there if you're the Bears. They should win that game. They're about a nine and a half point favorite on the road, but interested to see how Sam Jackson looks in Week One, uh, most likely as as Cal's starting quarterback there. Then at 5 p.m. Pacific time on ESPN, Utah against Florida. Got to have that if you're the Utes. I mean, they needed to have it a year ago. Should have had it. Didn't. Now you get revenge at home. Anytime, if you're the Pac-12, you get to showcase Rice Eccles on national television, that's a great thing because Utah fans are absolutely awesome. They are rabid. They are passionate. They are loud. And they're also really hard to send home with a defeat. Haven't done that uh, in front of them there at Rice Eccles in quite some time. As basically every team in the Pac-12 knows at this point, I mean, they have... You know, they, they trounced Oregon State a year ago. They trounced Oregon there a year ago. They beat USC in a thriller last season. Like, they, they've beaten some big-time teams and won big-time games there. And they have a chance to make a statement there in Week 1 against Florida. And then the late game is UCLA uh, in a sneaky good matchup against Coastal Carolina in a G5 uh, game at 7.30 Pacific time on ESPN. And that's the game that I'm talking about, going back to the discussion of leverage. Coastal Carolina... Going across the country to play UCLA. You're not putting that game on national television. ESPN's not going to want that game unless there's a Pac-12 school involved. They don't care about Coastal Carolina. They care about UCLA. They care about the Power 5 brand there and being able to put them on the late window. That's probably the least interesting game of of the bunch, though I am curious to see what UCLA's quarterback situation uh, looks like there. But again, Pac-12 games from start to finish, good, good place to be for the league in week one. There are other weeks, too, and we'll have to get to those, but that'll be for another day. Appreciate everyone listening. I will see you next time, and until then, hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.